Oh. Oh. Testing, there we go. The scripture reading is from uh, Habakkuk uh, in the chapter 3 in the first several verses, 1 through 6. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. Lord, I have heard of your name, your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Report and report. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his footsteps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. This is the end of that scripture reading. Lord, you are eternal. You are the only one who has made heaven and earth and all that is seen and unseen. And by your word, all things that are here that came into being, came into being by even just your breath. We are your creation. And we struggle with conflict. We forget how beautiful, how majestic are your mountains. We forget how quiet you have asked us to be so that your word could come in and fill our entire life. We get anxious. We uh, look around and we, we don't stop. We don't slow down. Yet when we get the opportunity by your faithfulness, O Lord, and we are in a mountain or down by a stream, and we are by ourselves and you are with us, we know you are God and there is no other God before thee. Bless us, O Lord, as we repent, first by admission of our sin and second from the turning of it, from it, away from it. Bless us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who by his precious blood on the cross gave us, every one of us, the free right of his children to come home one day. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Bless us, even us. Amen. Thank you, Mark. You may be seated. Well, as I said, this is Memorial Day, and we are remembering all those over the centuries, the last two and a half centuries, 246 years uh, of our nation's history who have died in the service of this country. And uh, because of their sacrifices, we enjoy the freedoms that we have in this country today. We're not a perfect country, no. Um, we are... We have been blessed by God so abundantly. And the people who have given, as uh, one of our founding documents says, the last full measure of devotion to this country, um, we honor them this weekend. And we praise God because he has brought us to this point. As I said earlier, we, we have our issues at this point, and we'll be dealing with some of those this morning as we look into Habakkuk. But God has still blessed us as a nation. He is the one who has founded us. He is the eternal Father. He is strong to save. Whether it's saving us individually through Jesus Christ, whether it's saving our nation, God is able to do that. 
This hymn uh, was written oh, a number of years ago. Uh, I don't even remember the year right now, but um, it was written originally as a song to honor the merchant marines, uh, those folks who were plying the seas, uh, you know, taking goods back and forth and so on. And then over the decades, it was adapted to focus on each of the various branches of the military. The, the, the verses that are typically printed in the bulletin uh, deal with the Navy. A anyone Navy here? Raise your hand if you were Navy. Okay. We'll leave that verse out then. Okay. No, not really. Um, but over the years, different verses have been done for uh, Air Force, Army, uh, the Space Force. That one was actually written before we had a Space Force. Uh, Coast Guard, all these things, all these different branches of the military have verses in this hymn that have been uh, ascribed to them. So we're going to sing this morning just, just four verses. We're going to deal with the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and then a verse that ties all those together. So let's sing, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. <laughs> in service to this country. Lord, we praise you for providing those folks. Father, we praise you that you have given this country strength throughout the years. Father, not just for our own sake, but Father, so that we might be a blessing to other countries as well. Father, this morning as we continue in our studies in Habakkuk, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember, Father, and to be mindful of the fact that you are still in charge, whether it's to Judah of 26, 2700 years ago, or Father, to the United States in this day and age, or any other country, Father, that will call upon you. Father, I pray that as we look to your word this morning, that it would be your word that is preached, that it wouldn't be my opinions, Father. And Lord, we pray that you will accomplish your purposes in each life here this morning through this. We'll praise you for it, for it's in your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, and turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. And uh, last week there was a Bible left. See, this is where we embarrass someone. Did you leave your Bible here last week? There was a Bible last, uh, left last week. It is an updated New American Standard Version, red letter edition. 
Okay, we'll uh, put it back on the table after church, and if it does look familiar, you can go ahead and grab it. Uh, and if you don't want to come up here because that would admit that you left your Bible here and you haven't been reading it all week, you know, we, we, won't, we won't go there, okay? Anyway, um, Habakkuk chapter 3, and let me, let me get my other part of my iPad put together here so I have everything together. There we go. We are ready to go. During the time that we have been studying Habakkuk over the last couple years now, uh, just kind of here and there, uh, we've seen some pretty intense interaction between Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk has cried out to God that Judah is in such bad shape. There's all kinds of injustice going on in the land and so forth. And asked God, how long are you going to wait around until you finally do something about this? And God has responded to Habakkuk's questions by telling him that he is going to do something about it. Something so utterly amazing that if someone were to come and tell Habakkuk about it, he wouldn't even believe it. And what that amazing thing is, is that God is going to send the wicked Babylonians a horrible, just bloodthirsty, nasty, nasty people against Judah. And, of course, Habakkuk has had an issue with that. He hasn't understood that. Uh, he can't understand how a holy, righteous God would use the wicked, ungodly Babylonians to accomplish his purposes in judging his holy covenant people. How can God justify such a seeming contradiction of his own nature to which God responded, in effect, don't worry about it. This morning in Sunday school, we touched on that a little bit as, as folks talked about, you know, why does God allow these bad things to happen, um, especially to kids, as we've seen going on here recently. You know, where is God when all this is happening? This is sort of where Habakkuk was coming from. God, what are you doing? All this stuff's happening. And you're going to send the Babylonians? I don't understand. Now, Judah was going to have to endure some, some tough times as Babylon swept through her borders and uh, was going to be taken captive, extorting uh, Judah's wealth through taxation, and generally making life miserable for everyone. Powerful as Babylon was, though, God assured uh, Habakkuk that Babylon would soon reap the bitter harvest of her wickedness. She would, in fact, be utterly destroyed because of her own evil. Her destruction would be accomplished at the hands of her victims, and Judah would be delivered. Now, when it comes, what it comes down to is that the almighty sovereign God of the universe really does have everything under control. And the events of history will unfold exactly as he has planned, just as they have been doing all along. And we look at that, and we say, God's in charge? Are you sure? I mean, we hear people say the inmates are running the asylum. And that's what it looks like so often in our country, in our world. The world is simply imploding. And God is in charge. Well, that's what he says. And so we have to take that at face value. God still is in his holy temple. Scripture says that. We believe that because that is what God says in His Word. We may not understand it. We may not understand that in one iota. But God is still in His holy temple. He's still running the show. And when that full realization of that finally hits Habakkuk square in the face, he does the only thing possible. He prays. In verse 2, he says, O Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Let's follow the back of lead and just go to the Lord for just a second here before we uh, get into the text this morning. Father, we do thank you that you are in charge, that you are in your holy temple, that you are running the show, Father, that history as has been said, it's his story. It's your story, Father. And you are going to accomplish your purposes. And Father, whether we understand that or not is really irrelevant. Father, what's relevant is that we need to trust you in that. 
And Father, that we need to be obedient to you in whatever capacity that may be. Father, this morning, as we continue here in this third chapter of Habakkuk, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds. Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us understanding into the text. And Father, how it applies in our lives today. Father, again, I pray that as I uh, preach this morning, Lord, that it would not be my, my ideas, my thoughts, my opinions, but, Father, that it would be what you want us to hear and understand this morning. And, Lord, we'll be sure and praise you for it. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. By the way, the reason the pastor is not here this morning, he did want me to share with everyone that he and Pusha do have COVID. And uh, they've had that now for about a week or so. Um, they are getting over it. They are getting better. And I told him, well, if you wouldn't be running down to California, you wouldn't be getting things like that. Just stay home. You know, and that's not going to happen because their son's down there and they want to go down there and visit with him. So they didn't get it from him. I'm not saying that. Don't go there. Okay, but that's why he's not here this morning. Um, God willing, he will be here next week because we're almost out of Habakkuk and I want to save the rest of that for later. So anyway, that's where, that's where he is this morning. Anyway, as we get into the message this morning, we're going to be talking about this topic of great is thy faithfulness. And this is what Habakkuk was understanding as he was having this back and forth with God. In chapter 3, uh, this is essentially Habakkuk's prayer to God. After God has explained to him what's happening, Habakkuk prays. And in this prayer, one of the things that Habakkuk looks at is the request for God's power. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in, your, in, in our day. Now Habakkuk's request for God's power to be renewed came as a result of his recognition of all that God had done for Israel in the 1100 years since her exodus out of Egypt. God had protected her. He had delivered uh, Israel from her enemies. He had given Israel the promised land. He had performed miracle after miracle after miracle on her behalf. And now in light of the coming judgment on, on the part of the Babylonians, Habakkuk was looking forward to the time when Babylon would be on the receiving end of God's judgment instead of, instead of Judah. You know, as I thought about that, as I was studying, 1,100 years from the time he had brought Israel out of, out of, uh, out of Egypt. And in that 1,100 years... God started off the show with the Red Sea crossing. They crossed over the Jordan. Uh, they took out Jericho. All these things that happened over and over and over and over again. And somewhere along the way, Judah lost track of those things. And so Habakkuk says, renew those things in our day. And I thought about our own country. We haven't been around 1,100 years. Okay, as a nation, we've been around 246 years. This, this year marks our 246th anniversary as a nation. And it hasn't taken us 1,100 years to forget what God has done for us. Go back and read some of the history of what happened during the Civil War and some of the skirmishes after that, the wars after that, the way God protected this land. Uh, case in point, just one example. Uh, during the Civil War, there was one particular battle, and I forget the specific one. Um, George Washington was shot at multiple times, just bullets all over the place. And sure enough, when the battle was over, his jacket was full of holes. And he did not have one injury. You know, God was protecting him in that. You're not going to read that in most, most school history books. But those are some of the historical things that we have forgotten as a nation. Judah had forgotten. Israel had forgotten. And so Habakkuk says, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day. Habakkuk knew the history of Judah and Israel. He had studied the scrolls, the law, and the prophets. He'd gone to synagogue school as a kid. He was himself a prophet and a temple musician. He had a thoroughgoing knowledge of all that God had done for Israel since he brought Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. And the only reaction that Habakkuk had to all of those deeds was to be in awe of them. That's the only reaction he could have. Do you ever stand in awe of God's deeds? Think back either on this nation or something going on in history or something in nature, something in your own life. Has there ever been some something 
that you have gotten so lost in that as you contemplate that that the rest of the world just kind of went away for a few moments while you were thinking about that? Maybe this is part of why God says, be still and know that I'm God, so that we will take the time to focus on those things and contemplate those things, um, to, to, to become transfixed by those things, paralyzed, as it were, by our inability to comprehend what God has actually done. And this is where, this is where Habakkuk was when he prayed this prayer. What was it, though, that brought Habakkuk to this place of such all-consuming awe? Well, the answer to that question is in verse 1. A prayer of the Bacchic, the prophet, on Shigionoth. Anyone know what Shigionoth means? I was hoping someone did. Okay. No, the term on Shigionoth is actually a very rarely used term in Hebrew literature. It's a very technical musical term. And it's used only in cases of the nations or an individual's complete reliance on God's faithfulness which is our next thing here. And it's only used this one time in Scripture, on Shigionoth. The basic meaning is to praise with strong emotion and impassioned triumph. This is a superlative sort of praising, to praise with strong emotion and impassioned triumph. Habakkuk recognized Israel's dependence on God's faithfulness. Israel would never have been delivered from Egypt or receive the promised land, were it not for God's faithfulness. Everything Israel as a nation, Judah as a kingdom, or Habakkuk as an individual, everything that they had was due entirely to God's faithfulness. Habakkuk knew that, that Israel, that the, the Judah as, as a kingdom, had been unfaithful to God more often than not, but it wasn't Israel's unfaithfulness that mattered. It, and I'm not saying it didn't matter, but what mattered was God's faithfulness to Israel, to Judah. As Habakkuk realized that, and as he looked back on all that God had done for Israel, he could do nothing else but be awestruck. And so he prayed on Shigianoth. He prayed with strong emotion and impassioned triumph. Has God been faithful to you as an individual? As you look back on your life, is there any, some one thing, just one, that you can look back on and see God's faithfulness, God's hand involved in your life. Was God there when you fell asleep at the wheel going down the road? Was God there when your child was so sick? Was God there when you got that pay raise at work? How about at the national level? Have we seen God at work in this nation? Now, that's primarily Habakkuk's view uh, in this whole passage. But as we think about our own nation, was God there when America won her independence from Britain? Was he there when the Constitution was written? Was he there as America rose to international prominence? I just read an article yesterday that speaks to God being there to protect our nation. How many of you saw the movie, it's 50 years old now, Dr. Strange Glove with Peter Sellers? Anyone? Okay. The whole point of that movie was some crazy general, Peter Sellers, who, you know, wanted to do this whole nuclear thing. Best part of the movie is with Slim Pickens riding the bomb down. Anyway, you have to watch the movie. It was, the whole thing was very dark humor. And everyone said at the time that would never happen. There's no general that could ever get a hold of things like that. Guess what? <laughs> Under President Eisenhower's um, uh, administration, that happened. The president alone did not have the nuclear key, as it were. That, uh, that responsibility was actually parceled out to several generals so that in case the president was incapacitated or not available, some responsible general could do that. Russia was doing the same thing. So yeah, God has protected us. We've seen his faithfulness. We have seen God at work. 
We have seen his faithfulness on our behalf countless, countless times. And with Habakkuk, we have to stand in awe of them as we recognize their source. But, and there always has to be a but in there somewhere. Let's go back to Habakkuk. Although Habakkuk recognized and was overcome by all that God had done for Judah, he had to admit that Judah had thumbed her collective nose at God's graciousness. And as a result, God had to pass judgment on her. God is long-suffering. He really is. 1,100 years he had put up with these people. But eventually, even God's patience is exhausted. And the deeds of a gracious providence have to be turned against those toward whom they have been directed. In Judah's case, God's patience had ended. Babylon was approaching because of God's justice. That's why Habakkuk was asking God for a renewal of his power. He wanted God to rescue Judah from her enemies, as he had done so so often before. But he also knew that, that God's judgment on Judah was well-deserved. He was looking for God's destruction of Babylon in his own lifetime. But he also saw the necessity of God's wrath against Judah. Habakkuk wanted God's deeds renewed in order to bring Judah back in line with her covenantal responsibilities. But that was a dangerous proposition. In order to bring Judah back in line, God would have to allow Babylon to commit all the atrocities on her for which he had condemned Babylon in chapter 2. Judah deserved everything that Babylon was going to dish out. And Judah would experience the full measure of God's wrath at Babylon's hands before she would return to upholding her part of the covenant. But God, Habakkuk pleads in verse 2, and you can still see the hope here in his writing, Habakkuk says, that's fine, but in wrath, remember mercy. God would remember mercy. But judgment would still come against Judah. When we think of America today, would we dare to echo Habakkuk asking God to renew his deeds in our day, asking him to restore America to the godly nation she once was? We were never a Christian nation per se, okay? We had a morality that was based in Scripture, yes. And I'm not saying we, this isn't replacement theory that we're taking over for Israel. I'm not saying that. But would we be willing to ask God to do whatever is necessary to, in wrath, remember mercy so that this nation could be brought back in line with where we need to be? Let's apply it closer still. Let's go beyond the national level or a little bit closer. Are there things in our individual lives, in your life, in my life, that need to be brought in line with what God requires, but we've refused to do so? Do we know that we're being willfully disobedient in some area, but we enjoy it too much to repent? Is there some one thing in our lives that we have tried and tried to get rid of, but it just won't go away? If so, do we have the courage, the faith, to go to God and to tell Him, Lord, I stand in all that You've done in my life in the past, all the mighty deeds that You've performed to bring me to where I am today, but Lord, I'm not where I need to be. And I want you to do whatever is necessary to bring me back into line with what your word says. Lord, renew your deeds in my life. But Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. That's a dangerous thing to pray. Dangerous thing. David didn't pray that specific prayer, but God did what was necessary to bring David back in line. Remember Bathsheba? David had a child with Bathsheba. God did what was necessary to bring David back in line. He took that child. Are we willing to pray, God, do what is necessary in my life to bring me back into line with your word? That was Habakkuk's prayer for the entire nation. He knew the risks involved, and he willingly took those risks. Probably, though, Habakkuk was less concerned with the risks 
involved in his request for a renewal of God's power than he was with the results of God's power. Risks are one thing. Results are something different. And we read about these results in verses 3 through 15. This is uh, almost the rest of the entire rest of the chapter. Follow along, please, as I read Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. This is essentially uh, Habakkuk's recitation of all that God has done. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains trembled, crumbled, and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Cushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out, stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Habakkuk knew that God is merciful. And he knew that God's deeds are always done out of a heart of love for his people. But Habakkuk also knew that where God's enemies are concerned, there can be no mercy. When God shows his power against those who would set themselves against him, be it Babylon or anyone else, the results of that power are awe-inspiring indeed. Now, it is those results to which the prophet refers in verses 3 through 15, where he speaks of the results of God's power on nature and on his enemies, which we'll get to in a couple minutes. The results uh, of, of God's power on nature, well, let's look, go ahead and look at those results uh, again as we look at verses 3 through 11. Now, the deeds in verse 2 that he speaks of here, uh, I stand in awe of your deeds, renew them in our day. Those deeds were all the wonderful signs and wonders which God had performed to bring Israel out of Egypt. They're the deeds of which Habakkuk stands in awe. The ones he wants renewed, the ones that prompted him to pray on Shigionoth. And as you would think about those, you've all seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, okay? Where they're going through the sea and it's all piled up on, on each side there. Would you be in awe had you actually seen something like that? Would you even be able to speak? You know, there's this wall of water, how high? And you're seeing fish swimming by in there. And it's totally just bone dry. And so Habakkuk is praying on Shigianoth. Teman and Mount Paran in, in verse 3 are in Edomite territory, and those were associated with God's uh, deliverance and His help during the Exodus in Deuteronomy 33, 2, and Judges 5, verses 4 and 5. In those verses, reference is made to the earth shaking, the mountains quaking, and that's the same activity that's recorded in verse 6 which probably refers back to verse 3. Verse 6, uh, he stood, they shook the earth, he looked, made the nations tremble, the ancient mountains crumbled, the age-old hills collapsed, his ways are eternal. Midway through verse 3, though, there's an interesting word here, and that is the word selah. And you see this throughout the Psalms. No one really knows for sure just what selah means. But the general consensus among language experts is that it's a kind of a, a verbal pause, meaning stop and think about that for just a bit. 
If so, I can appreciate why Habakkuk put it there. He has just written, he has just prayed that he's awestruck by all that God has done for Israel. And now he's about to recount some of those things. But before he gets there, and in his awe, he has to catch his breath, so to speak, before he can go on. And then when he does go on in the rest of verse 3 and in verse 4, he paints a picture of God's glory, praise and splendor, as though they were physical attributes. That's because they appeared that way to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19.16, we have a very graphic portrayal of what happened. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. And no one was playing the trumpet, by the way. That was coming from heaven. And a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Would you be trembling? If you're standing there at a mountain, all of a sudden it's covered with a dark cloud that totally envelops it, and there's trumpets. You know, special effects on TV is one thing, but in real life, that's a totally different matter. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. It wasn't on fire, but it was covered with smoke. Because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke. And trumpets were nothing because the voice of God answered him. I think that would scare us. In fact, the people of Israel told Moses... We, we can't deal with this. You talk to God, we're, we're going back home. You, you tell us what he says. We can't deal with it. Years ago, I was driving one morning from where we were living in, in uh, Roseburg, Oregon, driving up to Portland, and the sun was just peeking up over the tops of the mountains, and that early morning light was an almost physical thing as it sliced through the few remaining little clouds of, of uh, fog that were clinging to the roadway. That sunrise made a real impact on me because at the time I had just plugged in uh, a Bible tape. I had, you remember Bible tapes way back, you know, cassettes? Yeah, way back. Um, and I was listening to the book of Habakkuk because that's what I would do is I would be driving, I would put those tapes in and I was up to Habakkuk. And um, when the reader got to chapter 3, verse 4, the mention of sunrise or the reference to sunrise rather in combination with that brilliant sunlight that I was seeing through the windshield, that was a powerful object lesson to me of God's glory. And that has always reminded me of an old cartoon from years ago, uh, the character Ziggy. Anyone remember Ziggy? A little short, round guy? Okay. Um, in that cartoon, Ziggy is cheering on God for the sunrise. And he says, go God. Okay. Um, and that's, that's what that put me in mind of as I was seeing that sunrise and, and the scripture reading on, 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 the, on the tape and everything. The thought of rays flashing from God's hands where his power is hidden made me think. Just as things would be hidden from view if we were, if we were to look directly in the direction of the sunrise, which is what I was doing, driving down the road, and this is right in your eyes, you can't see anything. That's how it must have been on the Mount of Transfiguration, New Testament, when Christ was presented in all of His glory. And Peter and James and John were so overcome until Peter spoke up, and as usual, he didn't even know what to say. They were so overcome, and Peter, oh, let's, uh, let, well, let's build three tabernacles. That'd be good. And Lord God says, just listen to my son. Okay, they were so overcome. Just as Habakkuk is overcome, as he is recounting in his mind all that God has done. And again, to bring this back on a personal level, have you ever looked so intently into the face of Christ, not physically, obviously, but in your prayer time, in your scripture time, or as you're coming face to face with something like a sunrise like that, have you ever been so overcome that you just didn't know anything else? 
The Apostle John records it when he saw Christ there in the book of Revelation. During his vision, he fell at his feet as though dead. Habakkuk records in verse 6 that a mere look from God was enough to make the nations tremble. When he rose in all his majesty, the earth shook and the mountains crumbled. There's a verse in the Psalms that was put on a big poster when Mount St. Helens blew up. He breathes and the mountains tremble. It's a great poster. I don't know if it's still available anywhere. But when God rose in all of his majesty, the earth shook, the mountains crumbled. <clears throat> and in Isaiah's vision of God, here's another good illustration of this. In, in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had a vision of God, and the, and the train of his temple filled the temple, or the train of his robe, rather, filled the temple. And we read in that vision that the doorposts and the thresholds of the temple were moved. R.C. Sproul wrote about that in his book, The Holiness of God, and he said, The inert matter of doorposts, the inanimate thresholds, the wood and metal that could neither hear nor speak, had the good sense to be moved by the presence of God. They began to quake where they stood. Do you see why Habakkuk was so amazed? Verse 5 speaks of plague and pestilence both of which God used in bringing Israel out of Egypt, the plagues of Egypt, and as he did that later on throughout history. All of nature is at God's bidding and for God's glory. Verse 7 mentions Cushan and Midian. I saw the tents of Cushan and destroyed the dwellings of Midian in anguish. And the reason they were in anguish, the reason they were in distress, is because both Cushan and Midian were directly to the south of Mount Sinai. And so they look out their picture windows, you know, in their living rooms every morning. They have this nice view of Mount Sinai. And all of a sudden, one morning, they look out there. Mount Sinai is covered with smoke. The fire of God is descending. There's the trumpet sound. The earth is trembling. The mountains are trembling. Oh, and there's probably in excess of 2 million people that are gathered around the mountains. Is it any wonder the tents of Cushan were in distress? Would you be in distress if you saw something like that coming toward your front door? Verse 8, again, refers to the escape from Egypt. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? <clears throat> In the escape from Egypt, God turned the rivers and streams of Egypt to blood during the plagues. He, uh, the Jordan was stopped so that the Israelites could gather. Now, this is different from the Red Sea. In the Red Sea, it's just a body of water. God made a path through the sea, and the water piled up on each side. When they crossed the Jordan, at flood stage, by the way, the water just stopped. So, and it just keeps piling higher and higher and higher and higher. And downstream... It was dry. And the people downstream, what happened to the water? What happened to the river? And they heard about that, the people around there. And so they were doing all these things. God was accomplishing all of this with nature. The Red Sea parted so they could, so they could escape from, uh, from Pharaoh. And in this case, well, it, it says here, did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? The idea there is not the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, but God's horses and chariots, which trampled Pharaoh and his army. And obviously Habakkuk is using some, some poetic language here. Okay, not literal horses and chariots, but the Red Sea when it came back down and landed on them. As Habakkuk replays in his mind the, the mighty results of God's power over nature, it's just too much for him again. And he has to pause to catch his breath before he can go on. And so he says again... Selah, there in verse 9. You uncovered your bow, you called for many areas. Selah, I, I just need to break here for a minute, he says. In today's language, it blew his mind as he thought about all that God was doing. Spurgeon had pretty much the same idea when he wrote in 1855, a contemplation of the divinity is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned 
in its infinity. If you want to blow your mind, try to contemplate on the eternal, sovereign God of the universe and wrap your head around that. The results of God's power over nature doesn't stop at this planet. Even the sun and moon are affected by his presence. When the Israelites went to war uh, uh, with the Amorites in Joshua chapter 10, the sun and moon stood still. We see this in verse 11. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. Now think for just a moment on what has to happen to make, to make that happen. You know, the earth goes around the sun. The earth is revolving on its axis. The, the moon is going around the earth. You've got all these things going on. And God just put the brakes on it. And I forget how many hundreds of miles an hour the earth is spinning. But the laws of physics tell us if you stop something like that, whatever's on that thing is going to keep on going. And guess what? It didn't happen. God stopped it. Everyone continued what they were doing until the battle was won. On Shigianoth, indeed, he prays. The results of God's power on nature is probably more impressive than any of us can imagine, but it's no more impressive than the results of God's power <clears throat> on his enemies, as recorded in verses 12 through 15. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. And so the results of God's power on his enemies are seen in these verses. We see God's wrath and anger. And this is demonstrated when he delivered Israel there in verse 13. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from hand to foot. As the covenant God, the Lord, as it's translated in most of our translations, and that's all capitals, Lord, that's the word Yahweh. Jehovah, the covenant God. And he was committed to protecting his people Israel from all their enemies, to deliver them from, from Egypt and into the land of the covenant. Further, he was committed to delivering his anointed one, to saving his anointed one. Now that's an interesting verse right there. Verse 13, you came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. Who, who is this a reference here? Who is the anointed one? Well, in the immediate context, Jacob, or Israel, is the anointed one. This is the one with whom God made the covenant. His anointed one, his anointed people, his chosen people. In the prophetic context, however, the anointed one is Messiah. Both of these are in view. God came out to deliver his people to save both Israel and Messiah. But think about that for just a minute. If God had not delivered Israel, Messiah would not have been born. Now, I've, I've mentioned this before uh, from time to time about what God does in the past to affect the present. What has God done in your past to affect where you are now? Let me give you an example. When Robbie was in grade school, she started playing piano. Now, at the time, I didn't know her. When we finally did meet in high school, she didn't even like me. But, you know, she got over it. Um, that affected where both of us are. Robbie has used her, her piano playing over the years in ministry to God. She has been a partner in ministry. When I was in junior high, I think, before they even came along, our piano player at the church I grew up in said, Paul, when you get married, you need to marry a piano player. Right, whatever. Guess what? That's God working in the past to affect the present. The, the, what has God done in your past to affect your present? The realization of how God works all things together, as Roman puts it, is more than a mental exercise in what we might term spiritual mechanics. Taking the time to examine how an event in our lives today was precipitated by a particular act on God's part umpty nine years ago becomes a tremendous means of helping us 
to praise Him in a very specific terms. And it paves the way also for understanding more and more just how intimately God is involved in our lives and in our world. What happened 40 years ago to affect where you are today? What happened 60 years ago? What happened last week? God is intimately involved in our lives and in our world. That also, as, as we think about those things, you came out to deliver your people 1,100 years ago to save your anointed one 700 years in the future. When we understand things like that, when we contemplate things like that, that becomes a path of blessing, both for us and for God. It becomes a path of blessing for God because God is honored by our understanding of Him and how He does things like that. It becomes a path of blessing for us because God takes special note of our contemplations, of our thinking about those things. Malachi 3.16 says, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. People gathered together giving testimony. This is what God has done. This is what God's doing. And God wrote that down in a book of remembrance, just as he's still doing. And so this idea of the results of God's power on his enemies, this is, is not just demonstrated uh, by his wrath and anger, but it's also demonstrated in how, he, in, in how he delivered Israel. And he did so from all her enemies. And we have allusions to this in this entire text. We have uh, allusions of, of Egypt at the crossing of the Red Sea in verses 13 and 15. And that's recorded in Exodus 14. We have the defeat of the Amorite kings in Joshua chapter 10. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself, avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jeshar, the sun stopped in the middle of the day and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. So we have all these allusions to what God did in the past in these specific battles. But the, the implication here is what God had done in all of Israel's battles, in all of Israel's trials. And he did so, according to verse 12, by threshing the nations. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. What does it mean to thresh? It's an agricultural term. It means to separate the grain from a plant. And typically that is done uh, by the action, in our day and age anyway, by some kind of a revolving mechanism. Well, that sounds fairly tame. Listen to what some of the synonyms are, though, for thresh. Assault, assail, baste, not the kind in the oven, hammer, pound, pummel, beat, thrash, smash, lambaste. Those are really powerful words. And this is how God dealt with Israel's enemies. And those kinds of words are used to describe this threshing. In verses 13, 14, and 15, we have words like crushed, stripped, pierced, trampled, churned. Again, very violent terms. And this is what God did with, it, with Israel's enemies. And so we have Habakkuk understanding what God has done and what God is yet going to do. Look at verse, um, oh, verse 14. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. This idea of warriors gloating and being pierced by their own spear um, refers to enemy armies that God had routed at their own hand. In 1 Samuel 14 and 15, the Saul and his armies were going to battle against the Philistines. And it says in those verses that God put the Philistines in such a panic that they were killing each other with their own swords. 
piercing each other with their own swords and spears. Now, this may also be a reference to Babylon's fall to Darius in Daniel 5.30 and 31. In that account, um, king, oh, I can't think of his name right now, but the king of Babylon at that time was killed that night. Darius the Mede came in and took over. Babylon didn't lift a finger in defense. Darius just came right in and took over. Their spear pierced their own head, so to speak, by their own pride and debauchery. Um, verse 15, again, using some illustrations from, from nature. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great water. Now, this is a specific allusion to Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea, but the emphasis is on God's power over his enemies by use of nature. God is faithful. When we started out, that was the, the, the title of the message, God's faithfulness. God is faithful. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his people. He is faithful to his own character. He's faithful to his personal justice, to his perfect justice, rather. And as Habakkuk considered God's plans for his chosen people, as he grappled with the hard times that were ahead, he began to comprehend some of what God's faithfulness is all about. And as that comprehension dawned, he prayed on Shigionoth. Habakkuk was facing the destruction of his entire nation, the genocide of his people, the complete eradication of his way of life. And he prayed on Shigianoth. He praised God with strong emotion and impassioned triumph. In the face of what was about to happen, Habakkuk's entire being was wrapped up in praising God for his faithfulness to his chosen people. You know, we like to think sometimes that America is God's chosen people. We look at all the blessings, and surely we are God's chosen. Well, we're not, okay? We are not God's chosen people. To be sure, God has blessed us as a nation beyond any dreams that the founders may have entertained. Just as God blessed Israel over and over again. And just like Israel of old, guess what? We have thumbed our collective noses at God's grace and blessing. And just like God's chosen people of old, might it be that God has begun to pass judgment on this nation? Might it be that God is using nature to destroy his enemies, our own spear to pierce our head? Think of some of the natural things that have been happening. California has been in a drought and on fire seemingly forever. Parts of Texas last year were buried under snow. The NOAA is running out of names for all the increasing number of hurricanes and tropical storms that keep coming up. And all those storms and, and hurricanes, they keep dumping just tremendous amounts of water on different parts of the nation that are remaining underwater. All these different natural catastrophes is God using that? Is that God's judgment? How about, how about using our own spear to pierce our head? Using our own pride and arrogance? Since we've, we've all read about the, the school shooting earlier this week. Did you know that since January 1st of this year, there have been upwards of 220 mass shootings in this nation? Now, a mass shooting is, de is described or defined as anything that has four victims or more. 220 mass shootings. The last handful of years have seen the tor country torn apart and burned by riots. January 6th was either a demonstration or an insurrection, depending on who you read, what news outlet you watch. The LGDPQ plus lobby has managed to get the courts to define everything from sex to marriage and everything in between. Schools are actively pushing children as young as kindergarten to redefine their gender. And the abortion industry is busy promoting bails to support infanticide. Two states in this country are working on bills that would, that would allow abortion up to 28 days after birth. That's called infanticide. In California, that bill has passed the House. It's making its way to the Senate. Are you praying on Shigionoth? As we look at what is happening in our country, the means by which God may well be destroying this country may look different from what he did in Habakkuk's state of Babylon, 
but the end result may be the same. Are you praying on Shigianoth? Are you praising God in triumph with all your heart and soul as you consider the judgment he's bringing on America? Now, that sounds really treasonous. That sounds very unpatriotic, especially as we celebrate this weekend, the, this day that, that memorializes the sacrifice that so many have made in the years past to ensure the freedoms we enjoy in this country. But remember why it was that Habakkuk prayed that way. He realized that it was only through God's judgment that Judah would be restored. And so he prayed, O Lord, renew your deeds in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Will you pray on Shigianoth? Will we pray together? as a church about God's judgment on this country that all of us love? Will you pray with all your heart and soul in triumph over what God is going to accomplish? Will you pray that whatever else God may do with this country, that he will in wrath remember mercy? Would you stand with me please this morning as we pray and sing together, Almighty Sovereign God, Stretch out your mighty hand and restore this nation to what it once was. Almighty Sovereign God. announcements. The ladies are not doing uh, their Bible study on Wednesday, so ladies don't come out for that. Uh, Wednesday's Zoom uh, Bible study at 7 o'clock is still on. 
Um, also, the baby bottle offering that we've been doing the last couple of weeks.